Welcome back to Spitting Bars. Today we're going to skip ahead into chapter 4, verse 6 through 13, and we're going to look at this kind of broader covenant arrangement that God had with his people. Why does Micah just get to slide in here and start spitting bars and calling people to question? Well, it's all part of a relational context, and we want to understand that as we understand the role of biblical prophecy and how we can learn from it today. Let's do a real quick recap. Real quick recap. Can you try to say that like five times fast? Recap. Real quick 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 recap. Real quick. All right. I give it. Remember the covenant mission of the people of God. They were invited into a covenant through Abraham, this idea of, of a blessing to the world, that, that God's redemptive plan for the world would take place through the family of Abraham. God redeems them out of slavery in Egypt, and they come up to the Mount of Sinai, and they get this whole culture of, 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 uh, that would have been culturally relevant to their time, to the whole ancient Near Eastern world and beyond, they would show the world what it looked like to treat each other well, to have a system of economics, a system of holy calendar, a system of worship, a, a system of relationships, a system of judgments and courts, and all of these things that would show the world what it would look like when God came near to them and, 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 and imbued them with, with his characteristics, with his holiness, with his gentleness, with his mercy, with his love. And so it was a whole mission that they were supposed to live out the righteousness of God, live out his justice, live out his shalom among them. And the way they treated each other and the way they treated visitors, foreigners, and, and those from around the world, they were to model his character. And so uh, God would go with them in this tabernacle and eventually uh, in this, the temple in Jerusalem, the southern kingdom in which Micah comes to speak from that place, the, the prayers of the world were supposed to be heard. The accessibility of God was supposed to be highlighted and these people were supposed to carry across uh, the God's plan uh, to bless all the world through, uh, through this covenant people. What's at stake here when God's people who are supposed to represent him and help reconcile the world to him when when they don't represent him well and they mistreat each other like we've been talking about and they don't carry across justice and they have a bad taste for what is good the global mission of god is it compromised by people who carry his name but do not carry his character so in this covenant we need a dtr let's define the relationship We see from Genesis 1 that God was inviting humanity, uh, all of of humanity, uh, Adam, Adam, it means mankind, into his blessing. And he blessed uh, the the world as this relationship, this self-giving of God, that he wanted humanity to participate in him. And we see this recaptured after the fall with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And we see the blessing of God is still available, that God is going to partner with an an imperfect family, an unlikely family. And through that family, he was going to to bless all families with, with this presence of his. And we see that clarify sharply as we approach Exodus 19 at the base of Mount Sinai, where God proposes to his people, if you want to be a kingdom of priests, this is people that will represent him to the world, they would do this covenant life, this whole culture of embodying the character of God. And we see it Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28, some heavy reading. There's this section called blessings and curses that part of a covenant formula, if if we're going to enter into a a marriage, if you will, there's going to be blessings if if we live this out. But if, if we just take this and we just throw it away, there's going to be consequences because remember what's at stake is nothing short of God's global redemptive plan. What happens is the people that are positioned to represent God well, end up refusing to do so generation after generation after generation and God sends the prophets prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet to get the people's attention to recover their sense of vocation to recover their proximity to God to show them that he he cares about them and he's and he's willing like he did with with the Ninevites for Jonah to, to, to at, at, at a moment's turning, a moment's repentance, just, just one, one step toward God, look what God would bring about. Nothing short of a renewal of a whole people and a recovery of the mission of God. 
but their hearts get harder and they become recalcitrant and they refuse the voice of the prophets and even kill some of them. And so God enacts the covenant curses that if they're going to throw this away, he's going to do what he said would happen. And there's this thing called exile and he would remove them from the land, humiliate them, And that would be the means of their redemption. You pick up even right after the covenant curse section in Deuteronomy chapter 30. And it's God saying that even after you leave this, I'm going to do something to your hearts. That that, that your story and my story is not over even after you refuse me. You're going to recover your sense of mission and purpose in me and you find a new heart in me. And so we we, we see this whole redemptive narrative and all of its ups and downs played across the rest of the biblical story. And the prophets play a unique role in it. They are to get people's attention, to have them return to God so that God would bring about the renewal of their hearts. As we press fast forward on history, we know that they don't really listen to the prophets very well. And the need for a new prophet who would who would give us a new heart, becomes more and more apparent the closer we get to Jesus. So I hope that helps frame some of the context of what Mike is about. Before we dive into this prophecy that alludes to exile, I just wanted to orient ourselves in the shape of the narrative in which the prophets find themselves in. So let's dive into our text. You're going to hear themes of exile, and you're going to hear themes of return. The exile is this humiliation, this this removal of God's people from the land he gave them for the sake of humbling them, for the sake of making them aware of the very real dependence they already had. Humiliation gives one the opportunity for humility, and humility gives one the opportunity for dependence. And this is what they learn while they're in exile. And as they return, we find a renewed sense of faith and vigor. Let's read our text, and then we're going to orient ourselves to this theme of exile and return and its role in God's plan to bring about this covenant mission. So you're going to hear a theme of exiles. It hasn't happened yet in Micah's day. They have not been removed from their land, but it's coming. It's coming generations later. God's patience is astounding and amazing and inspiring. But for now, we're going to read this text and we're going to see how even before the people of God get to the brink of exile, when their disobedience is so flagrant that God removes them from the land, God is saying, don't worry, I'm going to weave you back in. I'm already planning your restoration because I know what's best for your heart. So, Listen to God say this to a people who seem to be completely numbed out to the reality that God is about to do something really challenging in their midst. In that day, declares the Lord, I will gather the lame. I will assemble the exiles and those I have brought to grief. I will make the lame a remnant. The Lord will rule over them in Zion from that day and forever. As for you, O watchtower of the flock, O stronghold of the daughter of Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to the daughter of Zion. Why do you cry? Why do you now cry aloud? Have you no king? Has your counselor perished that pains that pain seizes you like that of a woman in labor? Writhe in agony, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you must leave the city to camp in the open field. You will go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you out of the hand of your enemies. But now many nations are gathered against you. They say, let her be defiled, let her eyes gloat over Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan. He who gathers them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Rise and thresh, O daughter Zion, for I will give you horns of iron. I will give you hooves of bronze, and you will break to pieces many nations. You will devote their ill-gotten gains to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of all the earth. So just remarkable, this sense of the time in which Micah prophesying, Babylon's not even on the scene yet, really. Their, Their main threat at this time is Assyria. So I don't know how Micah's original audience would have received these words, but 
What I do know is that, like this metaphor of labor pains, that God's going to bring them through something very painful that ultimately will be very productive. And God is going to change their hearts through it. So how, how exactly do we read this, this whole theme of exile and return, this plan that God had that included this, this uh, covenant curse and covenant blessing and this restoration of, of his people? What are we to make of it? How are we involved in this story? It's helpful from an interpretive standpoint because we start to understand what Mike is talking about and who to whom and to why. That's really helpful. But for our own spirituality, for our own relationship with God, for those of us thinking, look, man, Mike is cool and everything, but this is kind of like pre-Jesus, and maybe we're just looking for some Jesus references, but I'm not really sure what else we're doing in a minor prophet. Let me let me read this, this theme, this motif, this it's all part of one big story. And so when we orient ourselves to the story, we understand the significance of what's going on in the New Testament and with Jesus even more. So let's read this from Matthew H. Patton. There is this sense here that, uh, you know, we are kind of in an exile of our own. The entire New Testament is an end of exile, beginning of restoration story. Every Christian knows that the entire New Testament centers on the cross and resurrection of Christ. But we have seen now that the cross corresponds to the end of Israel's exile and the resurrection is the beginning of the long-awaited restoration. Through his cross and resurrection, Jesus brings Israel's story to a climax. And we are now living in a new phase promised by the prophets. But the story is not yet over. And as we consider some of the kingdom promises above, we realize that some remain incomplete. As Patton alluded to, this exile theme plays throughout in our understanding of what Jesus is doing. And yet, we know that some of the promises of God to bring about this full restoration of all things, the full fulfillment, if you will, of all of God's promises are still on the horizon. So in some regards, just like in, in Micah's day, the people were waiting for some of these promises to, 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 to be fulfilled we are also waiting for some promises to be fulfilled. And so there's this sense of expectation. I, I really like John Foreman, you guys may well know, and I really like the Switchfoot song you may have heard before, Where I Belong. I'm going to read it real quick, and, and let me just kind of show you how I think maybe we can correlate some of this waiting for God's plan kind of mentality to affect our faith and our hope and, uh, and the way we live out our faith today. Until I die, I'll sing these songs on the shores of Babylon, still looking for a home and a world where I belong, where the weak are finally strong, where the righteous right the wrongs, still looking for a home and a world where I belong. This sense of even though uh, God did all this to, uh, to the covenant people to bring about something righteous, the sense that Jesus came to make things right, and the sense that still not all is made right in the world. We live in this unfolding, the, the God's redemptive plan, as much as it, it has been pointed to and fulfilled in Christ, it is not totally completed. This is a, a topic we call inaugurated eschatology. There's a video on our Youth Connected page you can visit. We had this series on this. You can check out episode six of an Eschatology 101 about this topic. Meow. We're really living between the ages of promises that Jesus significantly changed something. The kind of restoration that Micah speaks about happened. And in and, and, and so many ways it is fulfilled filled in Christ, and yet it is not fully consummated. And so we, like the people in Micah's day, are waiting for God's plan to come to fruition, and we have a responsive role to play in the present. We live in hope of restoration. We live as people of God's plan. This hunger for justice that Micah carries is something we can carry today because not all is made right. We have the obligation of what the prophets did in the most dire of circumstances, which is hope. So I want to close my reflection here with Walter Brueggemann on a word on hope here, and then we'll reflect. Hope is the refusal to accept the reading of reality, which is the majority opinion. 
Hope is subversive, for it limits the grandiose pretension of the present, daring to announce that the present to which we have all made commitments is now called into question. The language of hope and the ethos of amazement, it will finally be about God and us, about His faithfulness that vetoes our faithlessness. Those who would be prophetic will need to embrace that absurd practice and that subversive activity. We, because we understand, in part, God's redemptive plan, His agenda, His aims, dare to hope. No matter if war looms, no matter if, if, if things look like an exile type of picture, if we feel alienated, or if we're just craving righteousness in a world that seems utterly broken, we do the daring thing because we know in part where things are going. And, and because we're, we're in, in, imparted that beautiful reality that God indeed will make all things right, just as Mike is speaking to people who would, who would later, uh, their, their generations down the line, they would be sitting in the rubble of their city wondering where God was. To orient ourselves in those kind of moments to the plan of God, we can actually live in the reality of hope. And through Christ, we can actually bring about some of the beauty of that kingdom that is not yet in the already, in the here and now. So would you dare to have hope in God's plan? Would you dare to believe that God will make all things right? How would that change how you operate here and now if you dared to hope in God making all things right? on the horizon.